For the purpose of the recording, I'm just going to say that I acknowledge we're on Treaty 6 territory. Um, a valuable recognition uh, that I make at the beginning of every program. And without any more housekeeping, I'm going to turn it over to Anang for the beginning of the presentation. Good evening and welcome to the Sustainability Speaker Series event for April. Before I introduce today's speaker, I'll say a few words about the Saskatchewan Environmental Society. The Saskatchewan Environmental Society has been operating since 1970 on important issues such as sustainable energy and climate solutions, water protection, biodiversity preservation, and reduction of toxic substances in our environment. If you aren't already a member, we encourage you to join. You can always find out more about our diverse projects, activities, and how to get involved by checking out our website at www.environmentalsociety.ca. If you would like to receive email notifications of future events in the Sustainability Speakers series, you can send an email to the Saskatchewan Environmental Society and the email address is info, so I-N-F-O, at environmentalsociety.ca. In your email message, ask to be put on the list of people to be notified of events in the Sustainability Speakers series. This evening, our speaker is Joan Fedig. Joan Fedig is the Executive Director of the Saskatchewan Waste Reduction Council, an organization that is working towards a waste-free Saskatchewan. The Saskatchewan Waste Reduction Council hosts, con hosts conferences and events for the waste reduction industry and maintains a database of recycling options for Saskatchewan residents. They also promote composting, and supports the development of producer responsibility programs for products and packaging. Joanne's educational background is in home and family economics. Joanne will give an overview of plastic pollution and efforts globally, nationally, and locally to identify solutions. The title of Joanne's presentation is Plastics, We Can't Recycle Our Way Out of This. And with that, I'll turn it over to Joanne. Thank you, Anang. Just give me a second. No problem. Okay. Um, hmm. All right, so thank you to the Saskatchewan Environmental Society and the Saskatoon Public Library for the opportunity to share some thoughts with you on plastics. Um, the Waste Reduction Council has its own land acknowledgement. Uh, we operate as a provincial organization, so we like to sort of speak for the whole province. So Saskatchewan has long been home to the Plains Cree, Woodland Cree, Swampy Cree, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, Salto, and Dene First Nations. We recognize their traditional territories and the homeland of the Métis. Saskatchewan Waste Reduction Council respectfully acknowledges the historic and ongoing care of these lands and stewardship of the environment. We are all beneficiaries of the numbered treaties and we reaffirm our relationship with one another. So the title of the talk today is Plastics We Can't Recycle Out of This, Our Way Out of This, or for the Sherlock fans, uh, Recycling the 9% Solution. Um, Anang mentioned in the introduction um, the things about the Waste Reduction Council that I was going to say on this slide. I forgot I wrote all that stuff. So there you go. This is our website. This is, um, hang on, one more thing. I'm gonna make a laser pointer. This is our database where you can put in community and material. Um, our most recent conference coming up 
And uh, we have virtual repair cafes right now in pandemic times. So the next one that's coming up is very soon. It's April 10th. So on Saturday, we're going to have a virtual repair cafe. For today, uh, hang on. My outline for today, uh, I'm going to give you a brief history uh, in the form of a video of plastics, where they came from and how they got started. And then I'm going to, it's a very large topic, all the things you can say about plastics, there's many things. So I've picked a few of the issues to talk about, um, talk a little bit about what's been happening with the province and the national picture and some solutions. So. Somebody will tell me if the sound doesn't come through, but I'm gonna play it as if it is. I will let you know. Sounds good. Today, plastics are everywhere. All of this plastic originated from one small object that isn't even made of plastic. For centuries, billiard balls were made of ivory from elephant tusks. But when excessive hunting caused elephant populations to decline in the 19th century, billiard balls makers began to look for alternatives, offering huge rewards. So in 1863, an American named John Wesley Hyatt took up the challenge. Over the next five years, he invented a new material called celluloid, made from cellulose, a compound found in wood and straw. Hyatt soon discovered celluloid couldn't solve the billiard ball problem. The material wasn't heavy enough and didn't bounce quite right, but it could be tinted and patterned to mimic more expensive materials like coral, tortoise shell, amber, and mother of pearl. He had created what became known as the first plastic. The word plastic can describe any material made of polymers, which are just large molecules consisting of the same repeating subunit. This includes all human-made plastics, as well as many of the materials found in living things. But in general, when people refer to plastics, they're referring to synthetic materials. The unifying feature of these is that they start out soft and malleable and can be molded into a particular shape. Despite taking the prize as the first official plastic, celluloid was highly flammable, which made production risky. So inventors began to hunt for alternatives. In 1907, a chemist combined phenol, a waste product of coal tar, and formaldehyde, creating a hardy new polymer called bakelite. Bakelite was much less flammable than celluloid, and the raw materials used to make it were more readily available. Bakelite was only the beginning. In the 1920s, researchers first commercially developed polystyrene, a spongy plastic used in insulation. Soon after came polyvinyl chloride, or vinyl, which was flexible yet hardy. Acrylics created transparent, shatterproof panels that mimicked glass. And in the 1930s, nylon took center stage, a polymer designed to mimic silk but with many times its strength. Starting in 1933, polyethylene became one of the most versatile plastics, still used today to make everything from grocery bags to shampoo bottles to bulletproof vests. New manufacturing technologies accompanied this explosion of materials. The invention of a technique called injection molding made it possible to insert melted plastics into molds of any shape where they would rapidly harden. This created possibilities for products in new varieties and shapes, and a way to inexpensively and rapidly produce plastics at scale. Scientists hoped this economical new material would make items that once had been unaffordable accessible to more people. Instead, plastics were pushed into service in World War II. During the war, plastic production in the United States quadrupled. Soldiers wore new plastic helmet liners, and water-resistant vinyl raincoats. Pilots sat in cockpits made of plexiglass, a shatterproof plastic, and relied on parachutes made of resilient nylon. 
Afterwards, plastic manufacturing companies that had sprung up during wartime turned their attention to consumer products. Plastics began to replace other materials like wood, glass, and fabric in furniture, clothing, shoes, televisions, and radios. Versatile plastics opened up possibilities for packaging, mainly designed to keep food and other products fresh for longer. Suddenly, there were plastic garbage bags, stretchy plastic wrap, squeezable plastic bottles, takeaway cartons, and plastic containers for fruit, vegetables, and meat. Within just a few decades, it's this multifaceted material ushered in what became known as the plastics century. While the plastics century brought convenience and cost effectiveness, it also created staggering environmental problems. Many plastics are made of non-renewable resources, and plastic packaging was designed to be single use, but some plastics take centuries to decompose, creating a huge buildup of waste. This century, we'll have to concentrate our innovations on addressing those problems by reducing plastic use, developing biodegradable plastics, and finding new ways to recycle existing plastic. So let's get started. Visit ed.ted.com slash end waste. Not only can you educate yourself. Okay, so um, just uh, who knew that styrofoam has been a long, around since the 20s? I could have been hating it my whole life. Um, the first issue that I wanted to just get to from plastics, so there's a lot of different things. They mentioned a couple of environmental things in the video. Sorry. There we go. Okay. So the first thing that um, I want to talk about in plastics is what it's made from. Okay. Sorry about that. So it's made from non-renewable resources, made from petrochemicals of various types. That makes it um, unsustainable by definition. Um, it contributes to greenhouse gas production. Um, and um, the less we recycle it, the more we have uh, it coming out of the ground. There are many types of plastics, many chemistries, and they have many prop properties. So this makes life even more complicated in the plastic world. Um, with many types, it makes it difficult to get recycle them. You have to gather all the types back together again, separate them out. Um, a lot of them, plastics have various chemical additives in them to do various tasks like say flame retardants or to make them softer or harder or whatever it is that the plastic needs. And a lot of those chemicals are toxic. Um, and some of the ways that plastic is made makes it almost impossible for them to be recycled. So they have a lot of issues on what they're made from. There are plastics made from plants called bioplastics. Um, and some of these are created so that they're chemically identical to plastics from petrochemicals, which then puts them in the same basket with the same problems as the other ones. They are also typically a contaminant in regular recycling programs because they don't, if they do degrade, then they um, are a contaminant for the things that don't. The second issue for plastics is what it's used for. So we have a durable, versatile, flexible product and 40% of it is used to produce packaging, which has a singular function and then it's intended to be discarded. So a lot of the plastics that we have, we could find something else to use for that. Um, we also, um, in the grander scheme, besides just packaging, although I'm mostly focusing on packaging today, um, need to find solutions for the plastics that are in textiles and all the other things that plastics in, in, uh, in the world. So all of them need end of life solutions or uh, avoidance solutions. So 
plastics, using plastics that are durable, um, it's kind of dumb for things like this, where there's bottle caps and things that are meant to be used once. Um, I found this quote when I was doing my research and I like it very much. The single use plastic grocery bag, which was born about 50 years ago, is the answer to a question no one was asking and the solution to a problem that didn't exist. The reason that we have plastics being used for packaging is not necessarily because plastic was the option, the best solution for packaging, it's because Plastics makers were looking for more things to do with their products. And it, it's used to keep things fresh, but it gets taken to extremes at some point. This is not, I believe, a Canadian supermarket, but you might notice that even the carrots have wraps on them. Another issue with plastic is end of life infrastructure. There's a reason why recycling isn't the solution. So first of all, with so many different types of plastic, it causes a lot of problems. The sheer amount of plastic as well. So plastic production has doubled between 1999 and 2010. So there's more plastic um, since 2000 been created than ever before in its whole existence. So we're continuing to produce more and more of it and we are producing more and more types and if you are putting it into consumers' homes and you're trying to get it back out again, the fact that you have a whole bunch of different kinds makes it very difficult to um, get them back in enough quantity that you can do something with them at the end. The recycling infrastructure that we have is not really equipped to handle these changing plastic packages that are out there. Um, so, and it, it can be, but it takes a lot of retooling to do that. So when the first recycling for sorting, sorting facilities were put into place, um, maybe about 15 years ago, 20 years ago, um, they were designed to take all of the materials that are in the blue box and that are all mixed together and sort them back out again. And in doing that, some of it mostly by mechanical and a little bit by human sorting, um, the premise that they used was paper is flat, plastic is round. Plastics were bottles and yogurt tubs and that sort of thing. And paper was flattened cardboard boxes, newsprint, office paper. And so the whole thing is set up so that when it rolls off a particular sorting line, all the flat stuff shoots off in one direction and all the round stuff falls in a different place. And um, with all the plastic that has become part of packaging, this here is a plastic pouch, it's flat. And lots and lots and lots of stuff comes in plastic pouches now. And um, the box is still flat, but both of these are going to end up in the paper stream. So um, that's gonna make it a lot more difficult to have even just good recycled paper, which there are good markets for and that kind of thing. So um, that is a problem. I mean, it is possible to recycle, to have other ways to sort those things, but the equipment's expensive and they have to all be put together. So ocean plastic is another issue with end of life plastics. Um, the most famous quote now I think is that you know, in by 2050, there'll be more plastic in the ocean than fish if we go on the way we're going. So it certainly received a lot of attention around the world. Um, and there's a lot of, um, there's companies trying to find ways to recover ocean plastic and recycle it into new products. Um, there's more work being done. Um, a lot of the ocean plastic hits the ocean because uh, plastic in countries that don't have good waste management systems just ends up in the rivers and flows straight to the ocean. So there's work on that, but there's still a lot of things to do in there. Further inland, like us in Saskatchewan, we don't have ocean plastics to um, sort of see every day. This is our view instead. So we have litter and wind blown debris that 
we end up dealing with plastic in quite a lot. Um, plastic bags, things that are light like plastic bags go around. Um, anywhere you look that there's litter, there's always plastic in there. And um, this is what happens when you make a product that's designed to be used once with a package, a material that's designed to last for a long, long time. Not a good match. Um, they also have a problem with um, plastic bags, especially uh, at landfills where they blow around so much that they end up having to put up special fences to catch them all and then pay people to go and pick up all the plastic bags. And um, so it's a, uh, they're quite a headache. Another issue that has to do with end of life infrastructure is demand for recycled plastic. So virgin plastic um, mimic, mirrors the price of oil. It's made with oil products. And um, for the last while, it's been very cheap because oil hasn't been expensive. So it, the price of virgin is a lot lower than the price of recycled resin. And it's a lot easier to use virgin resin because it's a lot um, cleaner, generally speaking. They can guarantee that it doesn't have other types of plastic in it um, or other contaminants. Whereas recycled plastic, to get to that level of purity requires a lot of processing. Um, so they, there are people working on the demand for recycled plastic. So you'll see a lot of companies promising that they want to use certain percentage of uh, recycled plastic in their packages. Um, and the trick is going to be for them to be able to get that much recycled plastic that they can use, um, given that it's so difficult to get it clean enough that they can use it. And then they have to pay the extra premium for it as well. The plastic industry is its own problem uh, when it comes to the plastic problem. They, are absolutely not willing to discuss reduction as a strategy. Um, and production of plastics is scheduled to triple by 2050, uh, given the plants that are already in place. And when, this is straight up gossip, but uh, when the uh, federal government started to talk about how they wanted to have a strategy for zero plastic waste, the day after they announced it, the plastic industry was in the environment minister's office saying, but you don't mean reduction, do you? I mean, we go along with zero plastic waste, but we don't go along with zero plastic. Um, it's been a strategy of the plastic industry um, in North America to try and push the responsibility for plastics and the proper use of plastics and the proper end use of plastic onto consumers. Um, so they started with establishing, this KAB stands for Keep America Beautiful, basically an anti-litter organization that's heavily funded by the message out there, it's our fault that plastics are being littered in the environment and it's on us to fix it. Um, and so they've managed to keep the focus on individuals rather than the industry for quite a long time. The plastic industry also um, lobbies against bag bans and single use product bans. Um, if at least in the past when a community would start talking about the potential for um, a bylaw that would uh, take plastic bags, say uh, disallow plastic grocery bags or something like that, the plastic bag industry would come to town and um, start talking to people about um, all the benefits of plastic bags and how dirty reusable bags are and all those sorts of things. Um, they have quite a few, what are they called? AstroTurf groups, you know, fake grassroots groups that they fund so that they can get out the true facts about plastic bags. Um, they took the uh, city of Victoria to court a couple of years ago for their plastic bag ban. Um, and uh, so they're, they're very aggressive. Um, in the States, they have successfully lobbied 
quite a few of the states, governments, and have uh, laws in place that don't allow communities to put in plastic bags, bans. So anti-bag ban laws. <laughs> They have, um, from the start, um, insisted that recycling is the solution. And that you go in there. As well, it's more of a brand. Companies that produce products that then need it for something, and then people use besides plastics for their containers, um, they can find other ways to do things. And there are a lot of movement on this case of brand owners um, to look at reducing the amount of plastic they use. On another issue of plastics, uh, we'll just call it China. Um, so for about 20 years, China gave us a no questions asked outlet for plastics. Uh, when I first started in this game, which was more than 20 years ago, um, we despaired over being able to recycle our plastics because no one wanted them and there were no markets. And, and we, we just desperately wanted to recycle our plastics. And then all of a sudden it was like, yeah, no, we can do that. We can, we can take your plastics. We've got a market for it. No worries, no worries, no worries. And um, so for quite a long time, uh, we just threw everything that we had that was plastics into the bin and it got taken care of somehow. And um, so China was getting not only all the plastics they wanted, but a lot of what they didn't want. And some bad actors were giving them straight up garbage and pretending it was plastic. And so eventually China said, no, we're not gonna do this anymore. And they stopped importing plastic completely. Um, they also have their own, some of their own sources for post-consumer plastic now because they have their own middle class that's generating some that their companies can use. Um, and rather than being the ones that pick through the recycling and get the good stuff and maybe throw the rest in the landfill somewhere, they now will import plastic pellets that are ready to be reused or ready to be processed into plastic things. So they've just gotten out of the game completely. And this has totally thrown the whole um, recycling industry into a tizzy um, because for 20 years, there was no incentive for anyone in North America or Europe to really get into recycling plastic in a big way because it was, China was there, China was paying enough that you could not lose money getting it to them. Um, and so we sort of ended up without uh, a robust plastic recycling industry in that time. So it's now starting to redevelop again, um, just straight from necessity. So um, just a quick look at the local and national picture when it comes to plastic and plastic packaging. In Saskatchewan, um, Sarkan is probably recycles the most plastic of anyone in the province. Um, they have a very specific uh, feedstock, so it's all beverage containers, plastic beverage containers. And um, so their, their product is carefully sorted and well, uh, very sought after because it's a nice clean stream and uh, they have no issues getting rid of their plastic at all. The beverage container industry, um, as an aside, is one that went from a crappy package to a package that listened to recyclers and got them uh, a little more um, coordinated. So I don't know if you would remember, but the, the two liter packages that um, Pop used to come in used to have a black bottom and a clear top. And the black bottom 
was actually a different kind of plastic than the top. And so it was very difficult to recycle those things. And so the recyclers finally talked to the beverage people and said, look, this is dumb. Can we do it better? And so now all the beverage makers use the same um, PET bottle, all one kind of plastic. They've worked on the labeling so that it's easier to go through the plastic recycling systems. They've worked on the color so that there's green and clear and then somebody added in blue, but um, you know, there's, they've streamlined it a lot and they've got to a point where now beverage container plastic is pretty easy to recycle. Um, this is what needs to happen with a lot of the other uh, products out there. In curbside recycling, uh, we do, there are most uh, communities do collect some types of plastics, but with the changes to the market that um, China has seen, they, um, there's a lot that have, have uh, either cut back some or all of the plastics that they're collecting. And uh, a lot more plastic is going into landfill than ever before. Uh, and just uh, municipal, Prince Albert and Regina both um, have pledged to ban plastic grocery bags um, in the future. Regina this year, Prince Albert, whenever the pandemic is over. So that's the direction that those communities are going in. For Canada as a whole, the federal government, um, they have added plastic manufactured items to the toxic registry as a pollutant, which means that they can do a whole bunch of things to plastics that they didn't have the power to do before. Um, they're not considered toxic in the sense that we consider uh, things toxic uh, like poisonous, but it has been determined that plastics is a pollutant in the environment. It's a pollutant to animals. It's not been determined that large plastics are uh, a danger to human health, but, and the, the, the report that they used to, to put this in place said uh, that it needed microplastics needed more research. But um, because they're on that list now that the federal government can do some um, regulations that they wouldn't otherwise be allowed to do. Um, the federal government has also pledged to um, put a ban in for some single use items in 2021. So grocery bags, straws, stir sticks, six pack rings, cutlery, and foodware made from hard to recycle plastics are all on their list. So we'll see where it goes with that. Individual provinces have bag bans, Prince of, uh, PEI, Newfoundland and Nova Scotia. Other provinces have talked about it pre-pandemic. Um, they're the ones that have them in place. Um, another direction that provinces have gone is to get a lot more collaborative with the industry. And so Alberta is a um, plastics producing province. So they have started an alliance with plastics producers, brand owners, a whole bunch of different stakeholders to try and work towards zero plastic waste altogether. And so we'll see where they go with that. Um, some solutions, for, uh, this is just an underline of, you can't recycle your way out of this. So this is a big concept, circular economy, but this is the direction that um, nearly everybody is pointing us to for every product and every packaging out there, how can we conduct ourselves in a way that's going to not harm the planet? And one of the, over, the overarching frameworks is a circular economy. So this is a complicated schedule um, that the Ellen MacArthur Foundation uses to try and put together the parts of the circular economy. And it basically, um, splits the world into two pieces. One is what they call technical inputs and the other is biological inputs. So in the technical side, um, what you wanna do is keep resources in place as long as possible in any way you can to the highest use. And then at the end of their life, you want them brought back into the technical cycle and kept out of the biological cycle. So, and the biological cycle is all of the plants and bio, um, biomass, that kind of thing. 
and they have it has its own cycle that follows nature. So uh, when it comes to plastics and the circular economy, what you want is the same thing you want for everything else. You want to be able to extend its life to the highest use possible and recycling is at the very end. One of the um, tools that the circular to get to a circular economy is extended producer responsibility. This is a, 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 a way of doing things that um, requires the producers of a product to take on the responsibility for the product through its entire life cycle, including the end of life. For plastics per se, um, British Columbia has a program that the producers take care of all of what goes, all of the materials that go into the blue box, including all the plastics. And um, we have in Saskatchewan a partial system where the producers pay um, the municipalities for uh, a portion of the costs of the blue box to help them out but the producers don't have operational responsibility for the system yet. And the theory is that once producers have operational responsibility, then they can start seeing where they could redesign packages, substitute out things that aren't easily handled at the end of life, that kind of thing. And key to circular economy and basically everything is the concept of design when things are being designed, those decisions are almost the most important that you can possibly make because that determines what everybody else in the product's life or uh, anywhere has to deal with. You know, if you decide to use a plastic piece that's going to break and not be able to be repaired in your widget, then that Everybody, the person who buys it has to deal with that. The person who might try to recycle it or fix it has to deal with that. Design is key. And so there needs to be a lot of work on having the right design and the right materials and the right design. And of course, the Waste Reduction Council's favorite uh, strategy, a solution is reduction. Uh, looking at ways to reduce, avoid, substitute uh, for plastics. And this photo is a um, from the seventh generation website the seventh generation company uh, wanted to see wanted to start looking at the amount of plastic that they use and they decided to see what would happen if they did, went zero plastic um, they didn't do it for all their lines but when they started to think about how they would do this they realized that they could no longer ship liquids um, in non-plastic containers. So they changed their product to be a solid so that they could ship it in these metal containers. Um, so in order to reduce plastics, they actually changed their product. Now that's thinking and that's reduction. Reuse. Um, so a, a good news story there is that um, there's a, a company that's working in Europe and starting North America, we have it in Toronto, that's based on essentially the milkman model of old. So they've designed, put a lot of work, again, designing into the packages um, and they've made them reusable. So they deliver the package to the consumer or add the product to the consumer and then they collect the package back, run it through washing, put it back out again. So we'll see how far that goes, but it's uh, kind of a neat idea. And then there's uh, bands, that's a solution that's certainly come up um, of various things. And given how much, how many different kinds of plastic there are, how many different kinds of packaging there are, um, I'd like to see some simplification. And if we have to ban to do it, fine. I'd rather find another way, but really we need to make things simpler if you want to get all these things back and everything. So. Um, and then just finally, a couple of words about chemical recycling. Um, this is something that's come up in the last few years and it's a very appealing idea where um, traditional recycling is like cleaning up the plastic, shredding it up, 
melting it and putting it back into a new product. Chemical recycling breaks the plastic polymers down into monomers and then recombines them. And so it has the, the potential for um, getting rid of all the, a lot of the problems with mechanical recycling. But um, so far, it's not looking like it's going to be the answer either. Um, there are chemical recycling things that I've um, been told about. They, I thought you'd be able to take all the chemical plastic, break it down, combine it however you wanted to, and make new plastic. But it's tense. A lot of them are still at the bench phase. A lot of them are um, single type of plastic into a single type of plastic, which is good, but it's just not as useful as I thought it was going to be. So, um, and that is my remarks. Thank you.